John asked me a very good question. He said, but didn't Sekeri realize that if it's consistent, it's all right? That if, you know, you have bizarre consequences, but no contradiction, it's all right. You see, no. As a matter of fact, till about 1900, till Hilbert, nobody, nobody literally thought so. You see, people viewed mathematics as something which describes the universe. So being consistent among each itself, sort of, is not good enough. You have to be consistent with reality. Right? And if you show theorems which are clearly inconsistent with reality, there are no similar triangles which are not congruent, then obviously it cannot be so. It is, we have to understand that mathematicians historically, for m most of the time, actually laid claim that mathematics describes the universe. It's not just a game to get tenure. There is some other meaning to it. Right? So the starting from Pythagoras, the, the, the claim was that describes the universe. Numbers, remember? This is why. So geometry describes the universe. It was clear to Gauss. He said maybe the universe is non-Euclidean. But it wasn't the issue of consistency. The consistency which mattered was the consistency with reality, not consistency among the different propositions. Right? If you come up with, say, theory of numbers, which are some very bizarre numbers, but it's a consistent theory, it's not interesting because it does not describe reality. Right? If you have a consistent theory where 2 plus 2 is 5, it's just a bad theory. It's useless, right? So this, this was the view, literally, well till 1900. So at, the, at some point, people start challenging it. And this is why I put this statement here. Because this is this fundamental challenge where Hilbert says, it does not matter. These are just words. They do not signify anything. By the way, did he believe it? I don't believe so. We'll talk about it in a second. But it becomes a fashionable mantra that mathematics has no meaning. It is just a game. As long as the game does not lead to contradictions, it's a good game. If I could define something and the definition does not lead to contradiction, it exists. For example, if I say there is a chimera, and it doesn't lead to contradiction, there is a chimera. Well, uh, it's a strange logic, but that's what became the sort of prevalent logic, even while I actually believe that people who started talking this, from my point of view, nonsense, didn't believe it. It eventually became an established worldview. So let us look at Hilbert, one of the greatest men in history of mathematics, who sort of did so much, I have no words. I'll attempt to talk about it, but because he is central to, to a whole bunch of things we're going to be doing. Uh, but uh, describing Hilbert's work will take a journey, li literally. Uh, it's massive. It's massive. I just list a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, he starts with fairly obscure stuff with invariant theory. Then he works on theory of algebraic integers, starting what Dedekind did. Remember algebraic integers, thing like Gaussian integers and Eisenstein integers, we talked about them. But he builds a sort of massive theory around it. Then he spends 10 years of his life working on foundations of geometry. Uh, he decides that Euclid axioms are not good enough. And he spends lots of time sort of revisiting, reshuffling, and building new axiomatic system to, I'll talk a little bit, tiny bit about it. Uh, then he invented these little things called Hilbert spaces, which I used in, uh, to do quantum mechanics, say. Then he moves into mathematical physics. 
and uh, Cohen-Venn's general relativity theory. Uh, sort of argument whether Einstein or he was, but he was clearly building all the, you know, the gravity curve space and all that. So uh, roughly the same time as Einstein. Uh, and then he starts enormous activity on foundation of mathematics, claiming that we need to build a mechanistic theorem prover, a machine, maybe an abstract machine, uh, which will prove all the theorems. And uh, this is the program which eventually leads to work of Gödel and the work of Turing. And the work of Turing leads to Jeff Bezos. So, and you being employed. So, I mean, so when you get paycheck, you have to say thanks, David Hilbert. Uh, so, this is, this is literally, I'm not exaggerating what, what happens. Sort of the, this is the remarkable thing we're going to see during this journey, that uh, computers came out of the most obscure theoretical investigations in mathematics with no practical. So every time I hear practical people say, oh, you shouldn't do anything except write Python scripts, they're very mistaken. There would be no Python scripts if it were not for people like Hilbert. So uh, you need to know about him. You need to know about him. And I'm going to talk just a little bit uh, about his work, but uh, sort of let us see his axioms. Again, I cannot. Like Euclid had five axioms, remember? The number increased dramatically. So we go to about 20. Right? And I cannot describe the very complicated analysis of them will take forever. It, it, would, be, it would make a very nice uh, one semester course. Uh, I actually have Hilbert's notes for his one semester course teaching just that. Uh, so, uh, but let me point some something. Uh, it's just some things which Euclid took for granted. Like there is a point between any two points. He, he sort of took it for granted. There is no, I mean, no explicit axiom in Euclid. Hilbert makes it explicit, together with three other in between this axiom to assure that points lie where they are. Uh, works, works. It's it's a it's a wonderful thing. Uh, sadly enough, by the time he was done with axioms, he had no energy left to prove any theorems. So, sort of Hilbert's amazing. I have volume of his geometrical writing, yay big, and it's basically just axioms. Uh, he uh, sort of does a fabulous job. I'm not trying to, to make fun of it. It's a fabulous job. Again, the remarkable thing that it comes, the Euclid has no mistakes. Every single theorem in Euclid is correct. Just remarkable. It's not true for most modern math mathematical books. Like you could ask Paul, uh, who wrote one. So, uh, lots of mistakes. Euclid has no mistakes. All theorems are correct. All the proofs are solid. However, axioms are a bit shady. It takes 2,400 years for Hilbert to come up with new axioms. By that time, geometry as Euclidean geometry is f completely finished. Nobody does that. So, axioms often come last. This is, this is my mantra, sort of. You have to understand your space before you could come up with that. Uh, so he come up with, with, uh, with axioms, lots of interesting stuff. And then he becomes very famous in, uh, in the year 1900. There's an International Congress of mathematic, math Mathematicians in Paris. Everybody comes there. And of course, there are two great luminaries. Hilbert and Poincaré, and Hilbert uh, gives a speech where he poses famous 23 problems. The history of 20th century mathematics is very much influenced 
by 23 Hilbert problems. If you want to be famous, if you want to do something, you have to prove one of them. Not all of them are proved, and some of the proofs are still in doubt. That is, there are things which are sort of solved, but it's not clear whether they solved what you wanted them to solve. It's, it's, so I point few which would matter in the course. I cannot go to 23. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll be talking about continuum hypothesis. So I'm very key. Marx it as number one because there is a new hot thing called set theory. And Hilbert is very much in favor of set theory. It's very controversial. Most people think it's utter nonsense. And, but Hilbert is very much in favor, and he wants people to prove continuum hypothesis, which says that there are no sets which are bigger than integers, but smaller than real numbers. Nothing in between. We will see more precisely what it means. Very important, and we shall see the who and how solved it. Uh, then number two, proving consistency of arithmetic. It's not clear what it means, but he says, this is our basis. We have to prove it is consistent. And a lot of work by Gödel and, and uh, Turing, of course, uh, come, come to this. And then number 10 is a very, very important problem because that's eventually led OK, let me tell you what it is. It says you have a Diophantine equation. Diophantine equation is an equation uh, with many variables and integer coefficients. A, uh, 5x cubed uh, minus 3z squared uh, plus y equals 0. Does it have solutions in integers or not? There obviously should be a trivial algorithm, right? Such as an integer coefficient. These are just polynomial. There should be a trivial solution, simple algorithm. Well, it took many, many years and work of many people, but eventually through the work of Americans, uh, Davis and uh, Julia Robinson, and finally Russian uh, uh, Matusevich, uh, they proved that you cannot have it that there are polynomials with integer coefficients for which you could never determine whether they have zeros or not. They basically demonstrated that you could implement a Turing machine with the help of a polynomial. So simple mathematical problems are undecidable. So Hilbert, hit. so whole work on undecidability came out again from, from Hilbert's problem. And what he wanted, he wanted to formalize mathematics. That was his program, that we will formally write every proposition in a formal language, because somebody, we will see in a second, who already invented formal languages. And it's complete. Whatever, every true proposition will be provable. And it will be consistent, obviously. We don't want inconsistency. That was the program. Well, some people say the program failed. That is, Turing and Gödel demonstrated some fundamental limitation of this program. We still do not know what the meaning of the limitation is. Again, we will study it. The meaning of things is not always what it seems to be. Things, things are hard. Uh, so, uh, but he spent a lot of effort trying to work on that. And uh, here we have to go back in time a little bit, a little bit earlier than Hilbert to see a remarkable guy after whom this journey is named. And his name is Giuseppe Piano, a peasant boy from uh, Piedmont, from, spends most of his life in Turin. Uh, and you have to understand, when he is born, there is not even Italy. Italy is a new country. You realize there was no Italy. Oh, there was a piece of land called Italy, but there was no country. Right? It was ruled by all kinds of strange people, like Austrians or whatever. So he was born 
right at the time Italy was becoming a country, uh, by the time he sort of was grown up, finally in uh, 1871, they unite, sort of Rome becomes the capital. For a while, the capital was in Florence, but then they move it, move it to, uh, to Rome. And it's a new country. They try to establish universities. They try to become a big country. And of course, they're ignored by great European nations, such as Germans, because you know they're just Italians. They're supposed to play mandolin and you know, dance. They're not supposed to do mathematics. And here comes Piano who starts with several beautiful works and analysis. Among many other things, he invents something you should know called Piana Curve. Uh, he sort of determines that there is a curve, you know what a curve is, huh? which goes to every point of square. This is that there is a mapping from a line to a square. This is a continuous curve. Of course, it's not one to one. You can sum points in the square I visited many, 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 many times. You cannot have it otherwise. You cannot have a real bijection between an interval or continuous bijection between an interval and a, a square. So he does that, uh, publishes it. Uh, two years after that, Hilbert publishes the same thing in the same journal without acknowledging it. Because, I mean, Italian works not to be acknowledged. Therefore, all over the world, the thing is called Piano Curve, except in Germany, where it's even today called Hilbert's Curve. Uh, when Piano writes his great masterwork, of which we will, uh, he describes it and refers to Hilbert, not to himself. When Hilbert writes about it, he refers to himself. Uh, so, which shows this, this is one, Hilbert was very open-minded person, uh, sort of was very instrumental in sort of pushing women into mathematics, was a, you know, firm opponent of any anti-Semitic attempts later on when Hitler comes to power. But Italians, that's another story. So. Uh, it's, it's funny how, how people, people are. So one of the curses of Piana is that precisely he, he sort of started doing his great work when there is ascendancy of Göttingen. And he's in Turin, this provincial Italian. It's like you know, doing it in Zimbabwe nowadays. So he does it in Turin. And uh, then, of course, uh, he, he sort of does what Hilbert is going to say that it needs to be done 10 years after, after he starts doing it. So he is way ahead of, of the Germans. And in many respects, he does something utterly astonishing. In uh, 1891, he decides that it's totally unacceptable that mathematics is so spread, nobody knows anything because it's too big. We have to codify it. He comes with a great project that we will have a precise, rigorous description of all of the mathematics in one, one volume called Formulario Mathematico. It's on my table. I'm one of the very few proud owners of it. Uh, might be the only person in the Western United States. Uh, it's that rare. Uh, so uh, the the idea is beautiful, and he comes up with this idea of formal language. You could say, well, I mean, we have formal language now. You know, quantifies all this funny thing. He invented all of that. He figured out that you could write mathematics formally. But then, of course, he does another step, which is both absolutely brilliant and utterly suicidal. So he starts, and the book is, it's, it's, the book is absolutely glorious because it has sort of formal stuff. It has beautiful explanations, and it has all the historical quotations. So the book is pretty much, you know, combines, you know, 
if, if I were talented, my course would be like that book. But just, just wonderful stuff. And of course, he says, which language do I write it in? Nobody knows Italian. So he said, I'll write it in French, because French was the closest to the international language. You might not believe it, but United States dominance was not even remotely sort of thought of. And English language was well, some, some language. Nobody spoke it. So French was the closest. He starts with French. And then he says, two, f not everybody knows French well. And then it's very ambiguous. It's poorly defined natural language. And he comes with absolutely astonishing. He says, we need to design a natural language devoid of ambiguities, which all the scientists could write and understand each other. And he doesn't just say it. He does it. He designs this beautiful language called Latine sine flexione, Latin without flexions. Because you see, Latin is very hard grammar. This is a very nice vocabulary. So let's eliminate terrible grammar, eliminate all these conjugations, declensions, just they go away. And let's build this beautiful language. And he does. And the book, Formularia Mathematica, starts with the description of the language and contains the full dictionary in itself. Self-explanatory. It's just, it's a piece of art. It's a wonderful thing. Do you understand why I'm the only owner in the Western United States? The problem is I know Latin, and I learned at some point uh, to read the book. It's, it's very easy. But most people are not prepared to do that. And this is one of the sad facts that one of the great masterpieces of mathematics, one of the remarkable books, is utterly inaccessible. It's not in print. It's not translated. And it's just. Okay. And sadly enough, the only thing, it's a book of about 500 pages, which covers all kinds of wonderful mathematics, you know, real mathematics, analysis, geometry, everything. But the only thing people know is the first page of the book, which indeed became world famous, because that's why Piano came up with Piano axioms. Right? We'll talk about it. But the sad fact that as his life goes, let me just talk. Uh, he sort of he works on the formularia, but then he becomes more and more convinced that the work on Latina sine flexione is much more important because it's not just universal scientific language. If people would just learn it, all this hatred about between nations, all misunderstanding will go away. So he dedicates more and more of his time creating a very successful, he converts tens of thousands of people to follow him. There is association, they come with the name Interlingua, and there are many people study it, and they sort of do many things. Well, sadly enough, as one of the great ideas, nothing came out of it. And his program of formulario was defeated precisely by what he believed would make it irresistible, sort of the, the universal language. Still a wonderful dream. OK, so now I want to so Piano was clearly a person who invented formal mathematics, that write all the quantifiers, x, y, z's, things like that. And what does he say about, I want to sort of this is a quote from one of his letters. And um, this is his answer of, of tables, chairs, and beer mugs. He said, you could put any hypothesis, any axioms you like, and do whatever you please. But don't call it geometry. That is, his point of view was that geometry is geometry. Okay? And when we shall see, it's very important, we shall see later on, how it pertains to his axioms of nature or numbers. It is, again, Piano was very firm that while we have to invent a formal language, the reality is there. It's not just a language game. These are Piano axioms written pretty much the way he writes it, but I modernized, modernized the syntax. 
So he gives axioms of natural numbers. This is great. I mean, this is a sort of fundamental moment in history of mathematics. And by the way, it's known as Piana arithmetic. From that point of view, if you're a mathematician, you talk about arithmetic. You don't say arithmetic. You say Piana arithmetic, things defined by this axiom. Okay. First axiom. How does it read? There exists 0, which is a natural number. By the way, let me, I'll point it many times. There is something sneaked in before x, this word, set. And we shall see it's, it's we don't know what, what it is. Neither does he. He used what class, but set. So then he says that for every number, there exists a successor. This operation is a successor operation. For every two, there is a three. There is a successor. Right? Then uh, there is a third axiom. We will analyze axioms very carefully. So let us, let us look. There, for every subset in N, this is subset. If subset includes 0, and if for every n in this subset, n prime is in subset, then the subset is the set. This is known as the induction axiom. In some sense, this is the most important thing there is induction action. All kind of work on program verification and number theory and whatever you like comes from that. Then two more axioms. Again, you will see multiple presentations in different books. These are Piana axioms, meaning Piana listed them in that order in this very way. So these are not Alex's axioms called Piana axioms. These are Piana. So if successes are equal, then the numbers are equal. And finally, there are no predecessor of 0. There is 0 is not a successor of anything. You say, what about minus 1? Well, minus 1 is not a natural number. There is no minus 1. Right? So these are the sort of. And I don't know where it was a coincidence, but the number of axioms is five. Mm -hmm. I think it was no coincidence. No in piano. There's no coincidences in piano. So five piano axioms. And that's how they read in interlingua. I couldn't in Latina sine flexione. Zero as numero. Come on, anybody should be able to that. Zero non sequi ullo numero. Zero is not a successor of any number. Uh, duo numero qua abis successiva, actually successiva, that's his pronunciation, equale s, equale inter se. If successors are equal, numbers are equal. So very beautiful, very easy language. Again, assured total failure of his edifice. But, and he does both. He, he sort of, he, he is a good man. He writes this, and then he translates it into his language. So you could, you could say it. And by the way, all the historical references are in the original languages. Like when he quotes Fermat for last Fermat theorem, that's in French. OK. So in modern texts, there are people do all kinds of things and call them piano axioms. People typically say they start with one. I don't know why, but that's so they say. They often put the induction axiom last, meaning since it's very important, it should be in parallel with the parallel axiom and being last. Well, piano didn't. And uh, sometimes they 
we, we will be talking about logic later on, they replace second order induction with the first order induction axiom schema. If you don't understand, that's all right. In other words, what they do, they hate writing this. There is a subset. And they sort of do it for property, that if some property satisfied, then it's satisfied. But that's sort of the, there is no collectivization, collectiviz there is no subset. It, it makes logicians happy. It makes certain kind of logicians, very narrow kind, happy. But in any case, that's, you might see when you see piano axioms in books, these are three variations which you might in, in, encounter. But it's still piano axioms. Uh, but he, of course, was not the first, and he acknowledges it again. Piana is this remarkable guy. I mean, he even gives, he always gives credit to other people, however minor. He even gives credit to people, like in the case of Hilbert's curve, for the people who published after him. That is, he rather give credit to somebody than, than to himself. Wonderful guy. So uh, you know about Dedekind? Dedekind wrote a very important book in uh, about four years before Piana, where he sort of almost gets to Piana axioms, except he doesn't, but defines addition and multiplication inductively. We will see that one of the, you might remember in the beginning of the first journey, I was telling you that we cannot prove commutativity and dissociativity of addition at that point. And we had to wait. Now we're coming to the point where people could. And Dedekind proves it uh, in 88. Of course, there's another great mathematician who proved it all in 61, much earlier than Dedekind, except it is totally ignored. This is another story. This story I just cannot resist but tell you about this guy. Hermann Grassmann. Somebody was saying about unhappy mathematicians, Tom, and not well-adjusted mathematicians. This is the guy who combines one of the most remarkable successes or failures in human history with being even-tempered, happy fellow, and always sort of living normal, normal human life. That's how he looked. Observe the remarkable thing. What do you see? <laughs> you see his picture with the glasses, beard, and then there is something written here like mathematics. And this is Sanskrit. Why did they put Sanskrit there? Well, I have to tell you that. So this is from a poster in Grassmann Memorial Conference, which happened in 2008. And now he's a very famous guy, the Memorial Conference. But he was a very unsuccessful guy. I mean, he never could establish himself eventually with great effort. He gets a job of a professor of mathematics at high school. He becomes a high school math teacher at a small provincial place in eastern Germany, very eastern, uh, so eastern that it's no longer Germany. It was called Stetten, and now it's called Stetzin, sort of, because Russians and Americans decided that it's much better to give it to Poland and then take part of Poland and give it to Russia, and that will make everybody happy. You heard of Second World War? So, uh, so it was still Germany at that time, and it was still called Stetten. His father was a professor there, and after great effort, he eventually got promoted to his father position. It was a success. In the meanwhile, while he's doing it, he writes a bunch of works on mathematics and sends it to everywhere. And they're ignored because they're boring, unneeded, and probably wrong. Oh, he invents things like uh, find the dimensional vector spaces, yeah? all this thing, products, vector products. See the vector products? He invents vector products. He invents all of the stuff. When you take a course on final dimensional vector space, it's all his work, uh, utterly ignored, because totally useless. So then he observes that there is no 
sort of precise definitions of addition, uh, multiplication. Nobody knows how to prove associativity, commutativity. He publishes this little book, uh, Handbook of Arithmetic, where he does everything which we will do in this course beautifully, utterly ignored by the establishment being in that. And he says, OK, mathematicians don't like me. Let me go do physics. So he goes and says, oh, there are all these colors. And he invents this thing called color spaces. You know, red, green, blue, or magenta, whatever. All these color spaces. He invents, he comes with all the mathematics. The greatest color guy at the time, Helm Goltz, Helm Holtz, reads it, says, utter nonsense, utter nonsense. Nobody will ever build color televisions. Right? So he invents color sciences, utterly ignored. So now he's 50 years old. He did math. Absolutely astonishing math. Nobody liked it. He teaches high school, so he's happy. He has 10 children, happy family. He said, OK, I'm an old man now, 50 years old. I'm going to learn Sanskrit from scratch. So this is why Sanskrit. In five years, he becomes the world leading expert on Rig Veda. He translates Rig Veda. Rig Veda is the foundational text of Hebrew religion. It's one of the four Vedas and what did I say? <laughs> I meant Hindu religion. There is another foundational text of Hebrew religion. <laughs> uh, but uh, so the, the sort of he translates Rig Veda into, into German, composes an amazingly detailed and still the best uh, dictionary of Vedic Sanskrit. Vedic Sanskrit is very, very different from, say, Sanskrit of Mahabharata or Upanishads. It's very, very early version. So it does an amazing thing and is recognized. So this is the amazing thing. I mean, the guy does foundational work in three sciences, utterly unrelated, right? while keep teaching gymnasium, be, being very happy doing that. One of his sons inherits his job. You know, it's just, this is perfect, right? And right now there are conferences, and his uh, Sanskrit dictionary, I believe, is still in print in India. They're into Sanskrit there, at least some. You will be surprised how few. Try talking Sanskrit to Anil, you will see. This Seattle Indian, no. The, so, uh, but uh, so I, I had to mention him. You agree that you know, even he is not quite. So now let us prove independence of piano axioms. Let us see how this axiom comes. There are five axioms, and what we will see this is. This is the way you prove axioms, you analyze axioms. Because they don't teach you. They say axioms come from God. This is not true. People make up axioms. And when you make up axioms, you have to analyze them. You prove them. You, you figure out what's their relationship. And what we will do, we will see that if you remove an axiom, there is a model which we don't like, which is things will not look the way they See, so being independent is not good enough. Because what we have in mind, you actually have in mind something which is called natural numbers. So it's not enough if I give you axioms which do not contradict each other. We have to explain natural numbers. The intended model, that's a technical term in logic, believe it or not. OK, so let us remove the existence of 0. Well. If we remove the existence of 0, two axioms fall out. I mean, the first axiom which says there is existence 0. And then there is an axiom that says nothing, successor, 0 is not, zero is not a successor of anything. This is no 0. I cannot even state this axiom. Right? So we have these axioms. Well, I don't even want to look at them. There is obviously a bad model. What is the bad model? Let me tell you empty model, very good. How do we know? Look, if somebody gives you a bunch of axioms with lots of universal quantifiers and no existential quantifiers, 
you know it's a bad set of axioms because it has an uninteresting model, trivial model. We don't know, these are not natural numbers. If somebody says these are natural numbers, if boost comes up with an implementation of natural numbers containing no things, they would be wrong. They might do it, but they would be wrong. So now let us remove the second axiom, totality of successor. Remember, second axiom? Let me just remind you. Ah, ah. That for every n, there is a successor. There could be. And there are many useful things for which success is not total. But they are not natural numbers. Why? Because these are not natural numbers. Set containing 0 is not a set of natural numbers. It satisfies all the axioms except the totality of successes. 0 has no successor. Or 0, 1, not natural numbers. I mean, 0 and 1 are natural numbers, but it's not a set of natural numbers. Set 1, 2, it's not. Uh, there are many other examples. I decided not to list them all and put dot, dot, dot. So again, we're showing that we have to have totality of success. By the way, when we will start applying these axioms to our computational things, of course, we will abandon totality of success because we live in a finite universe of our computers, but not in mathematics. Right? So math mathematically, this axiom list. Now, let's remove induction axiom. There's no induction axiom. You could go one for this totality of success. You could go and go and go and go, and go and go and go and go. What does induction axiom say? If you go, go and go and go and go, go and go and go and go, you will get everyone. So, could you have a model where you don't have get everyone? Yes. So, we need to construct a model to prove, if you like, induction axiom to show that we need it. I'm going to use a technical term, transfinite ordinal, but ignore that. I'm just showing a model. You got 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, all the natural numbers. And then after you go through all natural numbers, there is a number omega, omega plus 1, omega plus 2, omega plus 3. Right? It's a model. It's consistent with every other axiom, but sadly enough, it's not natural numbers. There are no unreachable number among the natural numbers. If you start with zero and go, eventually you will reach it. That's a, we take it on faith, if you like, but that's what this axiom guarantees. There are no unreachable things. And of course, you know, when we get to set theory, they have, oh, so many infinities. So you could have first unreachable, second. But the first unreachable will do it. Right? So induction axiom says, no, you will not have unreachable things. Everybody is reachable. Invertibility of successor. If there is no, if successes are equal, then uh, the, right, you cannot have. So what does it tell us? Well, it eliminates a raw-shaped structures, things like that. You go 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, you got stuck. Success is fully defined. Deduction axiom holds. It's total function. I mean, everything is good. There is zero. Are these natural numbers? No, they're not natural numbers. They're just not. Raw-shaped structures are very important, but they're not natural numbers. Right? And without this axiom, you would get these guys. Then. What happens if we remove 0? Well, you see, there are two cases. Raw-shaped things force you 
to return before zero. But you could have a unique one-to-one -one correspondence between successor and predecessor and a large loop going back to zero, like that. So circular structures, a full circle, which we don't want. We don't want, again, induction axiom holds. Totality of successor holds, right? But, but it's not what we want. Again, we, there is this notion of intended model. OK, now, finally, we could define addition. There's this beautiful definition of addition. By the way, this is not observed, what we do. We do not prove this. We define this. We have an operation called successor. And I would say, let's have an operation plus such that a plus 0 is a, and a plus successor of b is equal to a plus b successor. These two things, two axioms of addition, would allow us to prove all the properties of addition. Let us go through. OK, we could prove that 0 is left additive identity, meaning 0 plus a is going to be a. We need to prove it. Observe. Base step is obvious because it follows from axiom 1 of addition. Substitute a with 0, right? Everybody agrees. Now. A plus 0 is A. Let us assume this is true. Then 0 plus A prime by the second axiom is equal to 0 plus A prime by the second axiom, which is equal to A prime. So we prove that if it holds for A, it holds for A prime. So if it holds for something, it holds for its successor. Using induction axiom will hold for all natural numbers. This is a typical inductive proof. Right? Sort of this axiom of induction allows us to do. Now, just for let's define multiplication. 0 times 0 is 0, this definition. 0 times b prim, uh, prime is a times 0 plus a. This is definition, two axioms of multiplication. And now let's prove that 0 times any a is 0. Well, base step from first axiom of multiplication, then assume by induction. And what do we get? 0 times a prime is equal by the second axiom of multiplication, 0 times a plus 0. And this, by the inductive hypothesis, is equal a, uh, is equal 0, and 0 plus 0 by what we know is, is 0. Right? Now, we define 1. Again, what is 1? One? 1 is successor of 0. Now, adding 1. So a plus 0 is a plus success. a plus 1 is a plus success of 0, which is by the second addition axiom, a plus 0 successor is equal a successor, right? Multiplying by 1. a times 1 is this, 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 this. I, they, I, I could read it, but it, I think it's pretty self-evident. Associativity of addition. Again, we do the base step by making C0. And if we make C0, it, it becomes trivial. Because we rely on the fact that B is equal to B plus 0. We, we know that by the first. Then induction step. We assume this, and we sort of work it out. 
you can. It's it gets tedious, but it's it's the standard f formula. You sort of you write this, then you say let, we assume that, then you rewrite this with with uh, uh, C prime, uh, then you transform it by using uh, uh, first edition axiom, then you by the assumption, this is associativity, you rewrite it like that, you rewrite it like that, you, you get this inside, and then you get this inside. So it's, it, it actually works. Uh, now it's my path. I, I am, again, it's all in the slides. If you have doubts, I highly recommend that, that you uh, double check a plus one is equal one plus a. It's exactly the same. And then we prove commutativity. And then this is a homework. If you want to learn something, do the homework. Otherwise, otherwise you just remember that Alex proved it in class, therefore it's true. This, believe it or not, this happens to most of us. Why do we know that something is true? We just know that you know, our teachers told us that. So it's not a bad. OK. And try to define total ordering between natural numbers using the inductive technique. OK. Zero is less than one, just for those of you who want this step. Uh, then uh, define predecessor and subtraction. It's all, I mean, it's routine. This, none of this requires great creative thinking, but just to, this is very, I mean, believe it or not, if you do that, all kind of proving programs correct will become trivial because it's basically using induction. So this, whatever, it's, it's useful. Now. So do piano axioms define natural numbers? Okay. I, I thought about multiple ways of addressing this thing, but then I said the best thing is to ask piano. The amazing thing, piano, the guy who invented piano axioms, didn't believe so. Axioms do not define anything. They describe it. Right? Like if you don't know what natural numbers are. Believe it or not, no amount of axioms will help you. I mean, how do you learn about natural numbers? By going through the third grade or whatever, first grade, and learning about natural numbers. Right? Sort of, uh, he actually starts, I cut it, he says that every child knows what natural numbers are. So I am not defining them. Right? And it cannot be defined. It, I mean, it's one of these things which one of primitive, it's like, you know, I don't want to go into Kant and notion of counting and notion of space and time. If you don't know what space is, nobody could explain to you what space is. If you don't know what numbers are, nobody could explain. But axioms are very useful because they allow us to structure our proofs and do proofs correctly. Moreover, it would be, especially for a computer scientist, it would be truly awful if we would define natural numbers like that. Think about how long it will take for you to add 100 plus 100. Well, you don't get it. Plus is defined with the help of successive function. You will have to do 100 successes. It's going to be linear addition, which fortunately for humanity, we do not have. Right? So this is not a definition of addition. It's an axiomatic definition of addition. You need to implement addition, again, the way it was done in the first, second, third grade, long addition, much faster. Right? So this is a primitive notion, again. You need to know what a natural number is. So Piana didn't attempt to teach you what 
natural numbers. I here attempted to provide a solid foundation for proving pro their property. So axioms explain, not define. Right? OK, let me give a personal example. When I defined containers in STL, did I implement them? Well, I did, but that was a different activity. The guy who defined containers didn't implement or defined iterator doesn't implement iterator. It's, there are no iterators. It's, you know, the iterator definition says if there was something, it would behave like that. But then you have to go and implement it. Right? The same with action. Explanation could be really slow, defining plus from successor. Or not constructive at all. You know, when in an axiom of group, we say there is an inverse element. It always bothers me. So, and how do you get it? Especially if it's an infinite group. Right? The, well, enumeration is not going to help if it's a very infinite group. Like for real numbers, enumerating till you find <laughs> an opposite number will take a while. Right? So. You know, it's perfectly all right, but it is perfectly all right. You see, the mistake we make is say that all oh, axioms are limited. Yes, that's the whole point. We want to make them as simple as possible, not as powerful as, they need, as we need for, for the implementation. Okay? So the conclusion of all of that, sort of there are these things called axioms that we shall see more of them Next lecture, we're going to do something really non-trivial. We'll try to look at axioms of set theory, which is a step beyond natural numbers. But we need to view them as a useful tool. So observe what we did today. We attempted to analyze axioms and say, we cannot remove this. We cannot remove that. That's what, right? And this is what you need to learn to do. For example, when you look, read documentation of iterators, you say, well, he says this. He says, well, let's assume he didn't say that. What would I get? What kind of aberrant behavior will I get? That's the kind of thinking which you need to practice when you deal with axioms. Of course, whether axioms could be practically useful, that's another question since you know, I have been pushing it for now so many years. And I would have to say with very limited success. So see you next week, and we will encounter other people. And we will talk about infinities. OK, bye-bye.